Well, Father, we thank you for today. Father, we just pray that you help us to understand your word and help us to uh, comprehend. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and open our eyes. In Yeshua's name, amen. So today we're continuing on our series on the Great Tribulation, and this is part three. So briefly recapping on what we've already discussed in parts one and two. In part one, I explain how there are different tribulations and what the word of tribulation is, as the word itself is an abstract word. So we explained the Hebrew word used for tribulation and gave a concrete meaning of this word, which I think is really important to understand. And part two, I started teaching on part of Matthew 24, where Yeshua is teaching some of his disciples on the end times what to look for and for what signs there will be. But in light of that, the admonishment he also gave about deception, not to be troubled and not to let one's heart grow cold. That's what I spoke about in part two. So this week in part three, I will continue on in Matthew 24 from where I left off last time. Last time after learning about the signs of the end, the beginning with the period known as the time of sorrows and understanding all about wars and rumours of wars, famines and pestilences, etc. So last time we finished with Matthew 24, verse 13, and it says, He who endures to the end will be saved. So I was teaching, in my opinion, the best thing one can do right now and moving forward is to draw close to God and to have a close relationship with Him and the Holy Spirit, the Ruach Kadesh. How does one draw near to God and know Him? By keeping His commandments, which include the keeping of the seventh-day biblical Sabbath, the biblical feast, the other commandments that are applied to the particular individual, whether they are a male or female, by reading delighting and meditating on his word by prayer and fellowship with the saints, by walking on the righteous path of the Torah. These are all ways we stay near and draw near to God. And this all starts with a repentant heart, confessing your sins to God and having your sins forgiven by the shedding of innocent blood, that being of Yeshua our Messiah. All these things, in my opinion, will go a long way to helping you endure to the end. So let's continue on in Matthew 24, verses 14 to 20. And it says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place, Whoever reads, let him understand. Verse 16, Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant, and to those who are nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight may not be, on, uh, be in the winter or on the Sabbath. Big passage of scripture here. There are a few thoughts and views on this passage and the ones that follow after this passage, which we're going to continue on. It is evident that verse 15 is connected to the following passages, which is in Daniel 9.27, Daniel 11.31, and Daniel 12.11. So you can look them up on your own. So it's quite evident that this verse, particular verse in 15, that says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of the desolation spoken of by Daniel, those three verses that I just quoted are connected to this verse. That's the context. Verse 15 is also connected to a Greek ruler by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth, in the, who lived in the second century BC who also did an abominable sacrifice in the temple of God, which it was known 
also as the holy place. By offering pigs on the altar, thus defiling the temple, also having altars throughout the countryside for the worship of their Greek idols. And this is the story of the Maccabees. So in our modern day translations, we don't have the books of Maccabees, but in my opinion, in the first century, they were part of the scriptures. So this is the whole story of the Maccabees, where they defeated Antiochus and his Greek armies, took back control of the temple and rededicated it by cleansing it and re-establishing the sacrifices on the altar, also known as a holy place. This is what the Jewish festival of Hanukkah is all about. Why is it called Hanukkah? Hanukkah is a Hebrew word. Hanukkah is the word for dedication, literally. So that's why it's called the Feast of Hanukkah because they rededicated the altar by cleansing and re-establishing the right sacrifices. This is what the Maccabees did. One view is that this was fulfilled when the Roman military general Titus, who defeated a Jewish revolt known as the First Jewish Roman War that led to the destruction of the temple and the city of Jerusalem, raising them both to the ground. This was commemorated in the Arch of Titus, which depicts this victory of carvings in the stone on the arch. In those days, they fled Jerusalem and Judea into the mountains. It actually happened. This relates back to the start of Matthew 24 when Yeshua said that this would happen. But here I just have a uh, picture of, this is the picture of the Arch of Titus. And you can see that the armies, the Roman armies, were taking away the furnishings of the temple. And we see here a picture of the menorah. This is depicted on the arch. When they destroyed the temple, they took all its furnishings. So like I said, in those days they fled Jerusalem and Judea when the temple was destroyed and the city was razed to the ground. They fled into the foothills and mountains of the Transjordian Mountains. And we're going to see right now that how that relates back to the start of the chapter because this is the context. So let's look at Matthew 24 verses 1 to 2. Then Yeshua went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And in verse 2 it says, And Yeshua said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. So this actually came to pass with the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem. And here's a picture of part of those ruins in Israel today. You can actually, they actually got them set aside so people can view some of these stones. This came to pass around 40 years after Yeshua's death and resurrection. This view holds a lot of weight and should be considered in light of what we're talking about in Matthew. Another view is that it was for then and it is for the end times before the day of the Lord, which Matthew 24 speaks of a little further in this same chapter. That this reveals a pattern, if you like, of some time in the future. So with that being said, there needs to be another altar set up for an abomination of it to take place. So if this is speaking of some time in the future, this same passage that we're reading about the abomination of desolation, there needs to be another altar set up for that altar be to be made abominable. Now many are saying that there is a big push for this in Israel now, and they want to control the Temple Mount again, as this is where the altar needs to be set up on the site of the temple that was destroyed. So it's one of the hot, hot, most hotly contested real estate 
strips on earth is the temple mount. Why? Because it's all about the temple and the altar. And there's a massive push to try and regain control of the temple, the mount, the temple mount, so they can set up their altar again and start sacrifices. My own opinion is that it is both of these views. That this passage happened in 70 AD, as clearly what Yeshua said at the start of the chapter came to pass, with the temple and the city being destroyed. There were three main revolts of, or, or wars against the Romans, which decimated the Jewish population of the day, turning them from a major population in the eastern Mediterranean region into a scattered and persecuted minority. This is what happened. This is why they fled. It is estimated between these wars, the three wars that were around at the end of the first century, it was estimated around 2 million Jews perished, which was massive in those days. They definitely fled to the mountains in those days. Early church writers say that the Messianic Jews fled to an area called, ended up in an area called Perea, also called Pella in those days, which is in the area of Galilee. And I don't know about you, but to get to Galilee, you've got to go over some mountains from Jerusalem. Here's a quote from somebody around him not long in the early days, Eusebius. And he wrote in his writings, the people of the, of the church in Jerusalem were commanded by an oracle given by revelation before the war to those in the city who were worthy of it to depart and dwell in one of the cities of Perea, which is called Pella. To wit, those who believed on Christ, Messiah, travelled from Jerusalem so that when holy men had altogether deserted the royal capital of the Jews and the whole land of Judea. So here's a recording of what actually took place. Here's another one. Epiphanius, and he wrote, The heresy of the Nazareans exists in Beraea, in the neighbourhood of Koei, Syria, and at Decapolis, in the region of Pella, and in the Basinitis, in the so-called Kokaba. From there it, it took its beginning after the exodus from Jerusalem when all the disciples went to live in Pella because Messiah had told them to leave Jerusalem and to go away since it would undergo a siege. Because of this advice, they lived in Perea after having moved to that place, as I said. So here we have two accounts of early writings of people fleeing Jerusalem and Judea into the area of Galilee. Why? Because Messiah said at the start of Matthew 24 that none of these stones will be left on top of each other. And that literally happened. So the evidence is that these things took place. It is also widely held that this is the birthplace, if you like, for modern Judaism. When they fled to the mountains, when they went to the area of Galilee, this is the birthplace of modern Judaism and where the oral Torah was collected and created. Galilee became the centre for the Jewish people and their leadership. This is where practices were introduced like they do now. They had no temple or altar. So they created practices to fulfill what the altar and the temple did. These continue in the form of Judaism and all the different liturgies and prayers that are said today, especially when it comes to the feast, and practices as done on the feast, this is where it was birthed from. They introduced and made all this stuff up to replace what they wanted to do in the temple and the, and the altar. So my current position is that these events happened, fulfilling what Yeshua said early in, chap in the chapter. However, the following passages in Matthew 24 indicate a future great tribulation which other believers, as do I, 
This is what Paul alludes to in his letters to the Thessalonians and in the writings of the book of Revelation. As far as fleeing to the mountains, this is what they did in the first century, as we've already explained. So I'm not so sure that that can be put into today's context. As a little later, as we will see in Matthew 24, 31, it says that they will be gathered from the four winds of the earth, which is an idiomatic expression saying from all over the earth. So in this passage I see a fulfilment already and a future great tribulation coinciding with what Paul and with what the book of Revelation teaches with the seals being broken, bowls being poured out, trumpets being blown and the four horses sent out as all parts of the great tribulation. At the same time, ruler or rulers reigning have the characteristics of the Greek leader Antioch, Antiochus Epiphanes, the Roman emperors, and then this can all be traced back going all the way back to Nimrod. So this, the characteristics that they ruled with, um, Antiochus and the Roman emperors, will be the same characteristics we'll see in certain people in our day and age. It will be the same way, the same treatment, the same spirit. There will be times of famine, pestilences, great climate events, the economic system failing and collapsing. As the word says, times as the world has never, ever experienced before. So let's move on. Matthew 24. 21 to 27 is our next passage. And it says, For then there will be great tribulations such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. And then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ or Messiah or there, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Another I like in that passage as well. So another reason why I believe in an upcoming time known as the time of sorrows followed by the great tribulation is verse 21, where it says there will be a great tribulation since has not been since the beginning of the world. Seeing this in light of our world history as discussed last time in part two indicates that the great tribulation is still to come because the events that happened after the destruction of the temple, in my opinion, were far worse. When you look at World War I, World War II, when you look at the, the Black Plague and the Spanish Flu and the Spanish Inquisition and many, many other climatic events throughout history, in my opinion, seem to be greater than the destruction of the temple. But however, the temple was where they met with God and drew near to God, so... I could see why it was such a traumatic time for them. This is the same to what was said earlier in the chapter with Yeshua saying, let no one deceive you. He's re reiterating it here again, which means he's adding emphasis. This is really, really important. We read about this earlier. a couple, uh, Last week, I think it was, that let no one deceive you, that there will be false prophets and false teachers. He's saying it again. One showing great signs and wonders to deceive. Now this is our test, and we all know this already. Our test to these people that prophesy and say stuff about the Messiah is do they teach the Torah? That's our test. If they do not teach the Torah, they are to be put on the shelf in my opinion. Do they follow the biblical feast and the seventh day weekly Sabbath? I don't care what they say or what they teach. If they're not doing those things, that's our test. 
Our test is do they follow and teach the Torah? If people say here he is or there he is, we are not to believe it. This is what Yeshua is teaching. And trust me, this has happened more often than you think. Daniel 7.13 I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Revelation 1.7 Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so. Amen. And again, in 1 Thessalonians 4.17 4, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him, uh, with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And again, in Acts Verses 1, 10 to 11. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Yeshua, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner, as you saw him go into the heavens. So why am I bringing all this up? We've just read four verses that clearly show that he will return on the clouds. Maybe something like this. I don't know. But he's going to return with the host of heaven on the clouds, the same way he left. Every eye will see him coming on the clouds. Yeshua returns the same way he left. Which is different to looking here and there which is different from going to the desert or to the inner rooms. He's telling us how he's going to return in the heavens, not in the desert, not in the inner rooms. He's coming and returning the same way he left, which is different to looking here and there as every eye will see and those who are in him and are alive, Paul teaches, will meet him in the air. Also, he says, as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west. This is an idiomatic expression that was understood at the time culturally. This is connected to the Feast of Trumpets, also known as One Long Day. They lit signal fires on the mountains to confirm the sighting of the new moon, as the Day of Trumpets is always on a new moon. And as... And it is the first day of the seventh month. The first day on the Hebrew calendar is always a new moon. This also fits in with no one knows the day or the hour. You will need to watch the teaching on the Feast of Trumpets for more on that idiomatic expression. Matthew 24, verses 28 to 31. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered also together. Immediately after the tribulation, on those days the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. This is opposite to the mountains. He gathers them from the four winds of the earth, from all across the globe, not from one specific place, like where they fled after the destruction of the temple. It says that he will send angels with a great sound of a trumpet, again alluding to the Feast of Trumpets, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end 
of heaven to the other. Revelation verses, uh, chapter 19 verses 17 to 21. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God that ye may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and all those that, who sit on them and the flesh of all people free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the king of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. So this is a direct connection to what we just read out in Matthew. Let me take it back. Wherever the carcass is, in Matthew 24 verse 28, there the eagles will be gathered together. So the book of Revelation and all those times when you read in Revelation, they fit hand in hand with what he's talking about here. The book of Revelation is that same time as the great tribulation of these days. All the birds were filled with their flesh. And they're talking about all the uh, mighty ones, all the captains, all the kings. People, free and slave, both small and great, all of humanity will be gathered before the day of the Lord and then he will return. As is the context of Matthew 24, 20, 28 is the end times and the return of the Messiah. This lines up with what I just read out in Revelation. The four horses, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls, Babylon, the different beasts, the false prophet, the harlot, the great last battle where the birds gather together are all in the book of Revelation and are all connected to this time we are reading about in Matthew 24. Notice this, that the elect's flesh is not eaten. Those who are of the elect, their flesh is not eaten. They are gathered together from the from across the globe. The elect are gathered together from across the globe from the four winds. It does not say from the mountains. It does say from one end of heaven to the other, meaning everything under the sky, across all the countries of the earth. There will be mourning because all the peoples will see the return of the Messiah and many will be found out in their sin state and realise they don't have the blood over their doorpost. Just like there was a great outcry and mourning on that night in Egypt of the first Passover. See a powerful pattern. All of Egypt was in a great outcry because they didn't have the blood of the lamb over their doorpost. The rest of Matthew 24 of this chapter goes on to reinforce what we've already spoken about with what to watch for, how to be ready and prepared, about not being slack in one's walk and be caught out just like the foolish servants and the five foolish virgins, which is at the start of Matthew 25. After Matthew 24 and at the end of Matthew 24, Yeshua teaches about a parable about the servants who weren't ready for the return of the master. They got drunk and they were drinking his food, uh, eating his food and drinking his wine. They slept and slumbered. They were disorderly. And then the, then the master came home. That's the end of Matthew 24. The start of Matthew 25 goes on to teaching about the parable of the ten virgins. The five wise and the five foolish. This is all connected to the being ready in the time frame that we're talking about. 
And we've already discussed about what it is to be ready. Matthew 24, verse 13. He who endures to the end shall be saved. So I want to reiterate again, he who endures to the end will be saved. And I've already spoken about how do we endure, what helps us to endure. And it always, for me, it always, always, always comes back to his word. Relationship with him, being obedient, doing what he says to do, worshipping when he wants to worship and meeting him when he wants to meet with us. Fellowshipping with the saints, because that's where you get your edification and exaltation, not out in the hillbillies by yourself. That's how we endure to the end. Well, Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you that you love us so much that you've shown us ahead of time what we can expect and what we, what we need to look for because you're a good father. You love us and you want us to endure to the end. Father, I pray that as we move forward as a fellowship and as individuals, Father, that we would be a people that would have open eyes and open hearts that would be alert and ready that we would be people that are obedient and wanting to please the Master, that we will not be found drunk and misbehaving, but we will be ready like a good servant for when the Master returns. For your word says that enter in, good and faithful servant. How is a servant good and faithful? By doing what the Master of the house requires. Father, help us to be good, faithful servants. Father, we thank you for your word and help us to be a people that endure to the end. Amen. Thank you for watching. We pray that this teaching has been a blessing to you. For more information, please go to www.ancientfoundationbiblefellowship.com. Shalom.